Hey folks, now this guest that we're going to have on today is going to be telling his story of how he got a bad news from his doctors and he was going to die. I recorded this podcast way back in January of 2022 and I started to work with this guy as a life coach to help me unravel all the messed up stuff in my head. I'm the first to admit we're all programmed to go to school, study hard, to make a lot of money, to save more money, to invest it, to make more money. A sick, sad thing when you think about at any point we could just leave and die and go elsewhere. If that makes you sad, maybe you gonna need to look for some higher being, which is what I've been looking for. And our guest today, Kevin Roth, has helped me uncover this in myself and help me. He's really taken a time to understand what we've been doing at Simple Passive Cash Flow and We've come up with this character for myself, like Robin Hood, where not quite we steal from the rich, but we give to the poor. We fight back against all that financial dogma out there where everybody's supposed to invest in these Wall Street investments that got in cahoots with the 401k that's supposed to leave your money in there for the rest of your working years, only to find that it makes your AGI explode in your 60s and 70s, exactly what you don't want it to be. But I digress. That's what I see myself. I'm a little bit of a, I like to have fun. I like to cause a little mischief. And I see myself as this Robin Hood character, minus the tights. And I like to distribute the real information out there. A lot of the stuff that we talk about on these podcasts. And for me, that gets me off. That's like my thing. I really enjoy talking to you folks after you guys get into our database, simplepassacashflow.com slash club. You book that onboarding call and that really, I tell Kevin all the time, like 80% of the time, eh, maybe 90% of the time, if you guys do your homework and listen to some of these podcasts first, I have a really good time helping you guys out on those calls. So if you haven't done so yet, let's get to know each other a little bit better out there. But uh, when we first started to work with each other, I would say in the first several months, he said to me like, Hey man, you don't have any feelings. I'm like, well, what are those? And I think what I like about Kevin, he's not like one of these like young life coaches that has no experience in just reading from the book, but he speaks from experience and from other groups I'm a part of their masterminds. That's a big thing is to speak from experience. Now, one cool fun fact about Mr. Kevin Roth is He's the guy that's saying that child Thomas the Train, Shining Time Station, PBS kids show way back in the 80s, I believe. Now, I'm not going to sing it for you guys, nor can I put it on this podcast because YouTube will probably not allow it to play. But you guys have probably all heard this song or maybe your kids did, Shining Time Station. But that's Kevin. Here. <laughs> that was in his first life. And he's been there, done that. He got really famous with that song and some other folk music and actually getting to know him a little better. He hated that stuff. He doesn't like little kids, but it's just a means to make money, which he later found that it wasn't very important when he got that cancer diagnosis and he found out he was going to die. Obviously, the guy's still living and I talk to him pretty frequently. But that's just a little fun fact there. So this was a start where I got to know him. He got to know me better than I brought him over as a personal consultant. And what I like about him, he says how it is and really resonates with me. May not resonate with you, but I think some of the takeaways from this podcast uh, will be pretty enlightening for you folks. Just have an open mind. And if this is not your cup of tea, then cool. Um, if it is, further reading would be go to an article I wrote about happiness. Right? What is all for? At simplepassacashflow.com slash happy. Are we just here to save money and make a lot of money at our job and get a high ranking profession or buy a bigger house? Surely it's raise kids. If that's not your thing. What is it? What do you put on earth to do? At any point, it could all end. But anyway, enjoy today's show. If you guys have any other questions that regards this stuff, feel free to shoot me an email, lane at simplepassacashflow.com. And yeah, here we go. This is a story about a dude named Lane. Then one day he went and tried to rent them out. And then he became one of the best of Hey, Simple Passive Cash listeners. Today, we are going to be talking about a little bit of a morbid topic, right? We all plan for the future 10, 20, 30 years, but who knows? Maybe this year, next year could be it for you. I just got back from a retreat with our mastermind. And sure, we're talking about investing. I think it typically moves towards non investing topics like family planning legacies and enjoyment and 
having gratitude for what you have is where the, the topics typically go through as people build more relationships with each other. And today I have a guest, Kevin Ra. He's a life coach down in San Diego, and he has a great story. And, and Kevin, why don't you kind of introduce yourself and tell us that story? And I think it would be very impactful for folks listening as you know, you're driving to work, working hard, saving hard, investing for the long term. But we want to do these types of podcasts that instill a little bit of awareness into what's around us and be, having more gratitude for what we have. Okay, well, it's nice to be with you. So I'm going to take 50 years and condense it into two or three minutes so you get a quick overview. So basically, when I was 13, I saw a musical instrument called the dulcimer, which is, if you're watching this, you can see the instrument above my shoulder. And at 16, I got my first record contract. And I made subsequently, between then and now, about 50 record albums. So my goal, when I was in my early 20s, up to about early 30s, maybe 35, was if I became rich and famous, I would be happy. So I got rich. I don't know what rich is to anybody these days, but back then having over a million was a lot of money. This was in 1990 something. I wasn't Bob Dylan, but I was, was killing it pretty much. And I became quite well known because I sang the theme to a hit PBS TV show for kids called Shining Time Station. So I was involved in having my own company. So I did my own licensing deals. I managed myself. I occasionally got an agent that did work. And I had a music attorney who's still my music attorney some 48 years later. So. Basically, what happened is in 2015, I had burned out from the music business. I had made a lot of money in real estate and lost a lot of money in real estate. I made a lot of money in the stock market and lost a lot of money in the stock market. And then out of the blue, in a nutshell, is I got diagnosed with stage three melanoma and told even though they removed the one little lymph node and a little spot on my nose, that there was a 70% chance it would come back within a year and I would be dead within two to three because there's no cure for melanoma as we're talking today. So this threw me into the, what I call the sea world cancer, which I never thought I'd ever have to look at. I worked out, I was healthy. I had everything outside looking in, looked pretty good. And then I got a death sentence and I tell my clients and people that interview me, there's nothing like a death sentence to wake you up. So I had to decide that if I only had a few years left to live and I had lost a good deal of money with medical expenses and uh, other little things, how did I want to spend the next couple of years? Because money didn't seem that important if I was going to be dead. I had enough fame. I didn't need more of that. And so what it came down to is I thought, what do you really want? Forget what Mr. and Mrs. Jones has down the street. I had long, probably a few years Prior to that, I had figured out from someone I knew who was making three, four hundred thousand dollars a year in corporate America, who came home and had four martinis to numb his life out. And that vicious cycle, that wasn't the life I wanted. I have a relative who's got, as he likes to say, more money than God. And he didn't seem all that happy. What did I want? And so who I was and who I am is I'm an artist. I'm a musician. I'm a writer. I'm a performer. And it was important for me to live in California, where it's beautiful here in San Diego, hang out with my dog and live an authentic life. But I had to change my mindset. I had to go from creating a life of abundance through what was really important. And I got involved, as most do when they get something like a major illness, you get reintroduced to the spiritual world or religious, whatever your take is on it. And how and long did this take? Do you go through like the steps of doubt or anger you mean when i got diagnosed yeah how long did it take you to come to this realization and maybe walk us through some of it oh you, you get it really fast when you have a couple oncologists tell you you're going to be dead in a couple of years you, you don't have a lot of time to to contemplate the first thing you do is you're in shock the second thing you do is what do i do now because you feel powerless you feel out of control and then there's western medicine and you have to understand that cancer is a big billion billion dollar business and then there's the Eastern way, which is people who cure themselves without chemo or radiation, and they do meditation or they change their lifestyle. So I had to figure out who was doing what. So I looked at people who survived, uh, like stage four melanoma, and had uh, bumped. I've met 
this particular one woman, Prudence Sinclair, and I said, show me what you did to get through this. There's something now called epigenetics. It's actually been around, but it's about the mon a body-mind connection. And how you think and how you feel really affects your system. So what makes people ill is stress and inflammation. Those are the two leader, leading causes of it. So if you're really overweight or you're really stressed and sugar really invites cancer. And if you get on the wrong side of cancer, not that there's a right side, but if you get on the really wrong side, well, that's it on, on the earth plane, so they say, because I don't believe that death actually exists. But that's all another podcast. I got, I got a little angry and I got very fearful and I started to look at different oncologists in Kansas where I was living at the time. I was making a new record album with Paul, with Peter, Paul, and Mary, one of my heroes. And there was one guy that I really liked his picture. I vibed it out because I have an empathic kind of quasi-psychic sense about me. So when I talk to clients, I look into them and help guide them there besides just the practical. And this one guy wasn't taking any new patients, but I had to get in to have tests done. So the woman that ordered the test, I went in to get the tests done. And then when I got the results, unbelievably, the cancer had not spread anywhere. But then she wanted to send me to a doctor who did lymphectomies. And I said, if you don't see any cancer, why are you sending lymphectomy, doctor? And she said, because it's protocol. So protocol is, we don't know who you are. We don't know what your name is. We don't care anything about you, but it's protocol. So next in line, please. And that really pissed me off. So I went to leave her office. And as I was leaving, I saw the oncologist card that I wanted on the desk. He worked there and I demanded that I leave her and go to see him. And I was not going to leave until he gave me an appointment. So I got in to see him, and he was the only oncologist that told me, I agree with you, Kevin, don't do anything right now. This happens in a year, because there's no cure for this. Let's deal with it in a year. So I had to wait a year to find out whether this was going to come back. So you go down the rabbit hole really quickly. These things also happen when you lose every dime you have with the Bernie Madoff kind of guy. Or something so tragic happens in your life that you hit bottom, you hit your head so hard, it sets you into a different reality. Because no matter how much money you have, or investments you have, or whatever it is that you have, you're not gonna have it when you're dead. So you have to, it makes you re-look at your life differently. And Did you have things, kids or, or any No, I have a dog, I have a dog. I've got you know, friends and a family. But I don't have any kids or anything like that. But I, your life rolls on whether you're single or you're married or, or whatever it is that you have but it sends you down the rabbit hole so the clients that i coach that come to me are interesting people some of them are very rich some of them are doctors medical doctors i have a psychologist i have clergy I, and i have a lot of professional people who come to me who, some of them work for the government who are on this kind of circle where i'm okay but i'm not happy I'm stuck. I don't know what to do. They've already discovered that having a lot of money doesn't buy happiness. They've already decided that, especially with COVID, life is short and I don't know that I like what I'm doing anymore. And that's why the big resignations happen. So there's nothing wrong with success. There's nothing wrong with investing and, and all that. But if it's your focus, if that's the reason you're doing it, uh, you're missing out on a really big chunk called your life. So there's a way to do this and to be really happy and it's called mindful awareness and to reevaluate the, the things that I teach. So one of them is what really matters to you? Why does it matter to you? And the third thing is what are you going to do about it? What's your plan and executing it? So a personal coach like myself, I really call myself a life consultant, teaches the tools that I actually use to get through all of this stuff and to go from basic surviving to thriving. I'm in a much better financial position now and everything like that. But I'm very aware of what's going on in my life and what I want in it and what I don't want to step into. Like I tell people, don't step into that. It's like seeing you're walking along, you see some dog stuff on the side. Don't step in it, which means you avoid stressful situations. You put yourself in places where you have a little more control and you can choose what is authentically all right. I think some people, some of us will listen to podcasts. We hear different tips here and there. We we'll do some goals, personal goal settings, but it's, it's always harder to do self-diagnosis on yourself because it's you. So what are some typical, as people start to think, what do they want? Why do they want it? What are some 
tip, like maybe BS stories they tell themselves or that you see is very common when your clients coming in. Just for well, the first thing is that most people come to me are very hard on themselves, and that comes from a way back in their the way they were raised or what happened to them or what didn't happen. My theory, I teach with the coaching. I have certain tools. I also teach a, a musical meditation called dulcimer meditation. That's the dulcimer above me, and I teach people how to play that. If you play a dulcimer, I can I sell them and I teach how to play. It's real easy, and it only takes about five or ten minutes a day to find clarity. But people come to me and, and they're really hard on themselves. They have a lack of clarity. They're on, they're in the rat race, but they don't quite know why. And they don't know how to get out of it. So what they tell themselves is, I can't give up what I have. So one of my clients lived in New York City and he lived in, I think, a, a studio and he was paying an astronomical amount of money. And I said, why would you do something like that when you can work virtually? What's your dream? And he said, my dream is to have a little cabin up in the mountains in Asheville. I said, so go there. He said, oh, I can't go there. So I work, through, I work with people and show them why they can and what's holding them down to New York. Ego, status, being a high roller. None of that really matters because uh, there are a lot of people who are very successful that live in the middle of nowhere that are really content. So you have to define what success. Success is mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual balance. You can have all the money in the world. If you're sick, nothing's good. Nothing feels good. If, if you are conflicted spiritually, it, it affects the way you view life. Because I also teach, besides the spiritual end of it, the science end of it. Science, the quantum physics, now goes with spirituality. In, in telling people that what you think is going on really isn't going on. It's a dream, it's an illusion. So it's a matter of having balance. The other thing I teach is that we're all gonna have good days and bad days, but it's how you ride the surfboard. Out here in San Diego, people are always riding the surfboard up there in, or out there in Hawaii, <laughs> but they know how to ride the wave without getting clobbered. So that, those are the tools that I teach. And here's the key to the whole thing. There's two expressions that I use, especially on my online course, it, it talks about this a lot, but one of them is if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And the other one is when you replace what doesn't work in your life with what does work, you don't go back to what doesn't work. So when I got the diagnosis of cancer, I put all the money I had in the world on the fact that it was brought on by stress because I was majorly stressed out for three years and it was all financial and emotion. It was ludicrous, but that's the lesson that I had to learn. You, you just look at things and you say, you know what? I just got diagnosed with cancer. I've got this relative who calls me and she's very negative and she likes to scream on the phone. I'm not going to answer the phone anymore when I see her calling because I don't need it. I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not going to do things that don't serve me. I'm not going to do a lot of negative things and I'm going to take time for me. I'm going to meditate. I'm going to eat. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to really start to enjoy my life. You know? That's the power of disassociating uh, relationships. I think that's a lot of people have this problem that I don't do this anymore. If I don't like somebody, I just don't interact with them. People think yeah. I'm a jerk, but I don't know. I just, but then well, on the I'm, other hand, if people pretty well and you get along with them, it can be the opposite side of the coin too. Yeah. You know, I was chatting with someone I hadn't even really met him. We were talking about something yesterday or the day before. And he said, I said, let's get together and meet. And he said, you're not going to like me when you meet me. And I said, I'm not. And he said, no. He said, when people hear my story, they, I, I repel them. And I said to him, thanks for telling me that. So let's not. That was it. You're, if you're telling me I'm going to not like you and I'm going <laughs> to, you're telling me that you're trouble to start with. You got to believe what people tell you about themselves. I just backed away from that cookie. I just said, okay, I'm a personal coach. If you want to talk about things, let me know. But when I see negative situations, a lot of them that I sometimes produce, I stop myself in the tracks. Like for this podcast, we had some technical difficulties, right? So there's two ways of looking at it. One is, okay, we're starting late. What's this technical stuff? Why isn't this technical stuff together? I completely switch that mindset and I go, okay, this is great. It's going to give me a chance to get to know, to get to know you a little more and it's going to be fun so it, again it's when you change when you look at things the things you look at change some people know how to ride the surfboard some people just lean in and correct it yeah you acquire a taste so when you get a death sentence you acquire a taste for peace and positivity and health okay that hershey bar no longer 
has the, the pizzazz that it had. Because it's sugar and it's crap food. It tastes good, but it's not good for you. And you know that by doing something else is going to make you feel better. Now, doesn't mean I'm not guilty of occasionally having my favorite Hershey bar, because I really love Hershey bars. But you understand that certain things in life serve you, and the way you look at things serve you. It's a matter of loving yourself, not in a selfish, egotistical way. It's about saying, you know what, I really figured out that I am a spiritual being having a human experience, and I deserve to be happy. And how do I find happiness, real happiness? Uh, a lot of people I know who don't have a lot of money here in San Diego, you, you, you think there weren't a lot of people because it's, how could you afford to live here? They're happy, man. I saw some guys eating some tacos. They were obviously yakking it up, man. They're just chucking it up with beer and tacos, having a great time. I have another friend who's, who's worth $47 million in real estate himself. He's always worried. He's always got problems. And nothing's ever good. He's worried about the elections. He's worried about COVID. He's got some street workers there having a taco, having a beer, laughing. And I observe that and I say, you know, what is it about the head space and the heart space of these people? And you learn a lot about yourself. Some people look at the, the exceptions, right? There's 10 tables at the bar or 10 stools at the top at the bar. One of them is twisted a little bit and they focus on that one. Or you could look at it a different way. At least somebody put the damn stools out for, for a change. Yeah, yeah. You, you figure out what you need to do to make yourself happy. For me, a lot of it is silence, is creating my own space so that I can write my, I'm writing a book about all of this. Next year, I'll start probably doing some touring with uh, these workshops that I give. And I'm always thinking about my clients. My clients aren't like, if you're booked from 10 to 11 on a Thursday, after 11, I don't think about you till the next Thursday. I think about all week long. So I'm very careful who I take on as well, because I want to be sure that we're, that there's a simpatico. But I love what I do. I really love it. And I'm good at it. Uh, the only reason I'm good at it is because I had to live through it. I didn't take a course in this. You can't take a course in death sentence. Okay. You can have all the degrees in the world. Ain't going to work, buddy. You have to be up against it and to say, oh my God, now and you learn american indians have this wonderful thing called the red road you learn about life that way and i only teach from experience i only teach from experience and things that i read and, and study that i find that's true which is why i bring the science element into this whole way of living too it's very simple it's a really simple thing and this is a kind of a classic ending of the story where the kevin goes through an issue he develops the systems and processes to get himself through it. And he becomes very compassionate towards others, people going through the same situation or can benefit from those skills and tactics that he developed going through the struggle. And it can be no different than somebody who went through, bought a rental property and now financially free. And I think everybody, maybe is maybe time to take us, like how did you go from going, getting through this terrible death sentence building the skills and how did you find this passion that you, you know, your business today? We all create stories. I am a real estate broker. I am a husband. I am a wife. I'm a corporate leader. Those are the stories that you create in your mind. My story prior to cancer was I was a recording artist on television. I'd made a lot of money. I got a lot of fame. That was who I was. It really wasn't who I was. It was what I did. After the cancer, the story changed because I said, I'm going to move back to California, I'm going to be bohemian, and I'm going to be an artist, and if I live a year, great, but I'm doing it my And that was the other story I created. When you create the story that you really want, not just in your head, but you connect to it with your heart, I hate to sound woo-woo, but the universe opens up. So I found an apartment for a $1,000 a one bedroom with parking here in San Diego, which is like hitting the lottery. No one gets an apartment for a 1000 but. But I did, and I started to just be myself, and then said to me, what's your next thing? And I thought, maybe I'll make a new album. The, the last album I had made had been thrown in the pot for a Grammy Award. And he said, dude, you got 50 albums. What do you need a, another one for? Why don't you teach people what you did to survive and go from a death sentence to no cancer and living a happy life? And it never dawned on me to ever do it. I didn't know that there were things called life. But I looked at it, and then I started to think, what did I do? What were the steps I took? And I put together a formula. I hate the word protocol, but I, I put together a, you know, a list of what do I do every day? How do I look at life? 
And then I started to get a couple clients and their lives changed really fast. One saved her marriage. The other one redirected their business so that they downsized but tripled their income because they stopped fighting themselves and so forth and so on. And I was amazed at not just what I was able to teach them, but what they taught me in the process. When a, when a medical doctor comes to you and, and, and they say, I can't do this anymore, I'm being burned out and I don't know what to do. This is a highly intelligent medical doctor, very successful. So I, I took what she wanted and I said, let's create that. So there, there are certain tools that, that you do that with, but it's different for everybody because it depends who you are and what you're coming to me for. But it's a combination of, again, knowing what matters, why it matters, your game plan, and understanding that you need a spiritual or religious connection to something, and that what that is scientifically real. So it's not woo-woo, it, it's like real. And I also watch, by the way, a lot of near-death experiences on YouTube because I love those things because all these people who have died and come back and these are doctors and lawyers these aren't like they all say the same thing that that they all felt like they were home when they uh, were dead or flatlined for X amount of time and my theory is that all of us are looking for that sense of home in this earth realm so we think we'll get it if we got enough money we think we'll get it if we uh, have enough power we think we'll get it if we have the American, but we're chasing our tails. You need some sort of a root system to know who you are. And then those other things come around. Again, it doesn't mean that you can't be very successful and happy, but you need to know what true happiness is for you. So is this life, like, is it real? Is it just an illusion? Or is it, we're in the waiting room right now to go later? <laughs> I'll put it to you this way. The people say, uh, science says that the universe is expanding. So into what, right? People say, everything is your mind, it's all in your mind. Where? So people say, oh, in my brain. Well, so if you dissect a brain, you'll never find a mind. So what is mind? So all these people like Deepak Chopra and these neuroscientists and blah, 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 they'll tell you that it's consciousness. So what's consciousness? So when you look at what consciousness is from a scientific viewpoint or the Vedas or the Upanishads all the way back spiritually into the texts, this world, it, it, it's an illusion. It, it, it's, it's a dream. It's like a, a sleeping dream, but we're awake. So when I first heard that, I thought, you're full of crap. What do you mean? I'm, I'm looking at you. You're telling me that I'm not looking at you? I'm not looking at you. Because if you look, what we're looking at each other on the screen doesn't exist if you look at it on a molecular atomic level. You look through it, it doesn't exist. That's quantum physics. So what is this? That's where it gets fun. And, in, and that's where your life becomes light. Because you think, oh, this is cool. This is like the Matrix. I like that movie. The way I think of it is you're just in a waiting room. We're going to go to somewhere good, but there's no diff There's no reason why you can't have some fun now. Yeah, the waiting room is here. There's no difference between there and here. It's just a matter of perception and understanding. And, and for the people that are probably shaking their heads at home, never listening to this podcast again, I guess maybe they'll come back next week, hopefully. But it doesn't. maybe it doesn't matter what's true or what's fact, but what is the if you what your belief makes you get to the final outcome or that more happier life no. now that really what's more important Probably. i'm talking about nobody listening to this can deny because if you break it down to covid you cannot deny that everybody who went through this covid experience and many of us lost people we knew had an experience of what is my life about they had to have that they were afraid of dying. How do I get it? How do I not? Get it? And that's why the big resignation. That's why people are rethinking their life. Now, some people believe in Jesus, some Buddha. I'm not saying what to believe in or what not to believe in, but just look at science. Look at the near-death experiences. Look at quantum physics. Look at what Albert Einstein said. We don't like to think about it because we can't wrap our heads around it. We like permanence. We like to know that when we're looking at us, we're talking to the person. And in the dream, we are. This is all real in the dream. So there's nothing wrong with the dream. The dream is an experience that we're having. But is it the ultimate experience? Of course not. It just isn't. I'd like to say, well, yeah, it is. But it isn't. <laughs> it's just, you know. But it's okay. You get there as you get there. Or you don't get there at all. It's something I've been, I think is, it doesn't matter what your belief it is. If science, religion, some other spirituality thing. If it gets you to a point where less stress, less sugar... Know, happier on a day-to-day -day yeah. basis the waves 
Exactly. That's what you want. Yeah, you want to be happy. And yeah. you can get there in a Honda or you can get there in a Jaguar. Depends how you want to get there. Wrap up here, Kevin. How can people get a hold of you? They can't because they don't even sit. No, I'm only kidding. A little joke there. KevinRoth.org. And if they want to look at an online course, it's also on my website. I do a free fret uh, stress buster video. If you go on my website, KevinRoth.org, it's totally free. If you want to set up a free consultation with me for 30 minutes, we can talk about it if we want to work together. And my music's on all the platforms, Apple and iTunes and all that stuff, or KevinRothMusic.com. I think a lot of the topics we talk about, especially trust or irrevocable trust, we're trying to leave it a family legacy down, or infinite banking where you more really joke that you're more valuable dead than alive to your spouse. It touches upon some of these topics a little bit and makes you ponder the end what's it all for but i think that the the message today is you out there you guys are you know, working really hard you guys are maybe to ponder why you're doing this why you yeah. want to work every day yeah and, and what i can do what i do for people is i help them take what they love and make it easier for them so that they don't have stress and as much stress so they don't have ambivalence they don't feel stuck now, i don't care if you want to make a gazillion dollars this matter to me it's how how you do it so that you're happy and that you love yourself and that you can love other people and, and help other people. And ultimately, that's really what it's about. It, it, it's, you can know, you talk a little bit more about, like, I think you're getting to like love relationships. I mean, that's something we talk about here is it's pretty easy to get to financial independence, in my opinion. The wealthier, the social relationships, social currency. Yeah. It's about authenticity and it's about loving yourself first. You can't love anybody else unless you love yourself. And before the cancer, I was all involved with my career and my money and my status. I didn't even know that I had uh, a Kevin inside me until I walked through my place after hearing the diagnosis. And I said to myself, I just said, don't worry, buddy, we'll get through this. And I had to stop for a second and think, who am I talking to? I've been broke, I've been rich, and I've been everywhere in between. Most successful people have. And in the end, it's really about love. When you're on your deathbed, and you look back, I'm very blessed that I have a legacy of 50 albums people buy and listen to. And some of this coaching stuff that I do that I know that has changed lives. And that's really nice. But whether I die, if I were to die tomorrow, I got a whole bunch of money. I don't even know who I'm going to give it to. I have to create a new will or something. But I like simplicity. I live way below my means because that makes me happy. I live a very uh, minimalistic kind of life. I don't have a lot of things. Because I don't need a lot of things to make me. All right, folks. Thanks for listening. We will put this in the archives. And I'll tell your friend about Simple Passive Cash Flow. Because if you're going to be not working one of these days, you're going to be looking for somebody to have lunch with. And you're the only one who's financially free and thinking about this type of stuff. It's a lonely world out there, Passive Cash Flow, folks. That's why you got to come to Hawaii with us. Well, and we'll start a spiritual cash flow business. All right. <laughs> All right. Good talking to you. This website offers very general information concerning real estate for investment purposes. Every investor situation is unique. Always seek the services of licensed third-party appraisers and inspectors to verify the value and condition of any property you intend to purchase. Use the services of professional title and escrow companies and licensed tax, investment, and or legal advisor before relying on any information contained herein. Information is not guaranteed as in every investment there is risk. The content found here is just my opinion and things change and I reserve the right to change my mind. Above all else, do your own analysis and think for yourself because in the end, you are the only person who is going to look out for your best interests.